Hello, I'm Darrell Owens. Welcome to A World of Difference. Our program celebrates and supports families rearing children who think and learn differently on their life journeys from kindergarten through college. A World of Difference is an educational outreach program of Beacon College. The Leesburg, Florida School is America's first accredited college or university devoted to educating students with learning disabilities, ADHD, dyslexia, and other learning differences. So let's dive in. From the moment Noah crammed animals two by two into a floating Old Testament menagerie, mankind has shared a close bond with animals. According to the American Veterinarian Medical Association, the human-animal bond is a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that is influenced by behaviors considered essential to the health and well-being of both. The bond includes, but is not limited to, the emotional, psychological, and physical interactions of people, animals, and the environment. More specifically, the field of human-animal interactions, and in particular, animal-assisted interventions, has greatly evolved over the past half century and become a more recognized, legitimate form of complementary therapy. What is animal-assisted intervention? Why are animal-assisted interventions important? Who can benefit from animal-assisted intervention? On this episode of A World of Difference, we'll saddle up and travel to a small Florida horse ranch to get a glimpse of animal-assisted intervention in action. Next, we'll explore the ins and outs of animal-assisted intervention in our Ask the Experts segment. Finally, we'll introduce you to this month's Difference Maker, a world-renowned scientist, author, and speaker who has spent a lifetime making the world a more humane place for both livestock and the neurodiverse. How does animal-assisted therapy work? What kinds of animals can be used as therapy animals? In what scenarios is animal-assisted therapy used? We'll provide answers to those questions and more coming up shortly. But first, when it comes to animal-assisted intervention, it is not as simple as one study warned as a pet prescription is all that's needed for miracles to occur. Yet, there is increasing evidence that shows students with learning and attention issues and anxiety concerns may benefit from reliable and effective interventions incorporating therapeutically designed human-animal interactions. In this month's Rising Above, we visit Umatilla, Florida, where Jennifer Castillo Vedia, a learning specialist and occupational therapist trained in animal assisted therapy, will showcase the benefits of animal assisted intervention through a simulation featuring Beacon College students. Here is correspondent David DeJohn with the report. We're gonna get to work with the horses and we're gonna groom, brush them because it's important for them to get these experiences as well. They need to have their hair brushed just like we do. Today's classroom to takes place uh, in the exactly. great outdoors where really these students will interact with two horses, one named Colby and the other Solaris. The technical name for today's activity is Animal Assisted Intervention. Grace, Miles, Hannah and Bryn share one thing in common. They all have learning disabilities. And today's intervention is about getting them to go beyond their comfort zones. Slip it over kind of like a headdress. There you go, over the years. This is Grace Matthews' first time on a farm. She normally works inside with computers. If I'm in a class that's not web and digital, I will get nervous a bit, I'll get, because I'm just kind of thinking like this isn't my specialty or this isn't something I've really ever done or I'm not used to doing and so I'm just, I don't really know how, how I'll, if I'll be comfortable with it, mm -hmm. kind of just what to expect and that can be kind of nerve wracking. Animal assisted therapy can work in so many different ways. Um, I think a lot of people associate it with horseback riding or, or being on the back of a horse. 
but there's really so many different ways to interact with the horse. We do a lot of groundwork. We do a lot of interaction with tools, with talking, with just being in their spaces and just letting that all play out and see what's going to happen. You know, the reason why horses are used for this therapy is, well, they like people and they're, they're curious, which also are dogs and cats. They can also be used for therapy, including other animals, ranging from hamsters to birds. What makes the horse a little bit more unique is they have such unique behavior um, and you just don't know what you're gonna get. For this exercise, students must follow a specific set of instructions, memorize you? those instructions, and then carry them out while leading a horse all by themselves. I wanted that safety of like, okay, which bucket am I going to? Um, so, because I didn't want to go to the wrong one and you go, wait, 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 wait. That <laughs> is a big part of listening, following directions, and um, completing that task, especially when it relates to time management. Did anybody have a hard time like uh, keeping their focus or attention with this? No? In addition to tasks that animals may be able to perform, animal-assisted interventions are also very helpful due to the human-animal bond. This is a symbiotic relationship that is found to produce feel-good chemicals. Also, using animals in lieu of other options or as a preventative option can save on expenses. In fact, a recent study estimates that pet ownership saves Americans almost $12 billion in health care expenses every year. When you're standing next to an animal this large um, and seeing their, uh, their interactions that are not always predictable, you get a sense of confidence and you can carry that uh, with you outside of, this, outside of this environment of how you handled yourself and what am I going to do next. Did she just say the horse's actions are unpredictable? While we were interviewing, the brown and white horse grabbed the camera and threw it upside down. She's going to be watching this and I... You son of a gun! You son of a... Is that going to ruin your camera equipment? Metaphorically, animal-assisted intervention flips the thinking process upside down as well all in the name of expanding the way these students think about daily life. Taking a, a deep breath and like talking to myself and saying that everything's gonna be okay, that there are people here that are like here to help you and work with you and then um, go to someone that I can really talk to and feel comfortable talking to about like any situation or problem that I have. Reporting for A World of Difference, I'm Dave DeJohn. <laughs> Thanks, David, for that informative piece. Now, let's take a closer look at animal-assisted interventions with our panel of experts. Today, we're joined by Ashley Colasea, Patricia E. Kelly, and Dr. Brian Ogle. Ashley Colasea is the founder and owner of SpeechPath LLC, a speech and language therapy practice in Farmington, Connecticut. Since receiving a certificate from the University of Denver in animal assisted therapy, she now specializes in AAT as a therapeutic method for her clients with learning and processing disorders who benefit from working with animals to achieve their individual goals. She received her bachelor's degree from Boston College and her master's degree from the University of Connecticut. Patricia E. Kelly is a former U.S. Marine and equestrian trailblazer who has been at the helm of the Hartford, Connecticut-based nonprofit organization, Ebony Horse Women Incorporated, for the past 36 years, which now operates as an equestrian and therapeutic organization and is a leader in the field of culturally competent services providing equine-assisted therapy and psychotherapy. 
Kelly, who has been inducted into the National Multicultural Western Heritage Museum and Hall of Fame and the National Calgary Museum and Hall of Fame, was named a CNN Top 10 Hero and is tr a trained equestrian instructor, certified urban riding instructor, and is certified in equine assisted growth, learning, and therapy as a horse specialist. Dr. Brian Ogle is an assistant professor of anthrozoology with specialties in zoos, aquariums, animal shelters, human wildlife conflict, and pet animal ownership at Beacon College. He is an education advisor to the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, Filet Taxon Advisory Group, a former executive member at large for the Association of Professional Humane Educators and a board member for the Humane Education Coalition. He served as a program director at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Ogle earned his bachelor's degree in adult education with an emphasis on biology from Bellevue University his master's degree in anthrozoology from Canisius College, and his doctorate in curriculum and instruction from the University of Central Florida. Joining me in studio is Dr. Brian Ogle. Hello. Welcome aboard, Brian. Thank you. So our first question today is, um, animal assisted intervention carries a broad umbrella. What qualifies? So it does carry a broad umbrella, right? We talk about interventions that could be social, cognitive, um, emotional, they could be education driven. Um, really at the end of the day, what really defines all of these together is that it's goal directed and it's a, a planned intervention um, to achieve that goal using an animal as that vehicle um, it, to deliver whatever therapy has been uh, described or prescribed by the, the practitioner. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question goes to Ashley. Ashley, in what scenarios is animal assisted therapy used? Many age and different needs can certainly benefit. Um, I typically embed AAT as a tool in my speech and language therapy um, with ages, you know, preschool through young adults with social communication challenges. Uh, and that usually includes um, clients with autism spectrum disorder, social pragmatic communication disorder, among others. Um, and then just some kids and clients who are just more motivated by the presence of an animal. So this question is to you, Patricia. Who can benefit from animal assisted intervention? Animal intervention can be useful for almost anyone, but we have to depict what that means, animal intervention. So at our facility, there are two kinds of therapy that we use. One is called animal or rather equine assisted therapy and equine assisted psychotherapy. Equine assisted therapy is generally any kind of activity that involves a horse. Could be riding a horse, unmounted activities, grooming, tacking, walking, that kind of thing. Equine assisted psychotherapy is always delivered by hopefully a culturally competent licensed therapist along with a horse specialist and of course a horse and a client. So equine assisted therapy, the generalization of it all can be useful to almost anyone. It works great with people who have a lot of anxiety and stress, but those individuals who are suffering from a deeper type of trauma could really benefit from equine assisted psychotherapy. So Dr. Ogle, how are animals selected for use in animal intervention? So it's not an easy kind of a, a one size fits all, right? So typically what the animal or what the trainer is looking for is an animal that has um, a well-rounded temperament and personality in which the animal is going to be able to handle stress, anxiety, um, being around humans for a prolonged period of time, um, and then also just be able to have a good relationship with the handler. And that's a, a critical component because there needs to be that trust that exists between the animal and the handler. Um, there's also not just one type of animal that works for animal assisted therapy either. Um, you know, dogs and horses are kind of the, the easy go-to ones, um, but we've seen pigs, we've seen guinea pigs, chickens, um, llamas, all Packers, you name it, and it's been used in animal assisted therapy at some point in time. Thank you. Ashley, 
How do you incorporate therapy dogs in speech and language therapy? Um, so I carefully choose my clients um, who would benefit from AAT. I'm a traditional speech language pathologist. I do typical articulation therapy and things like that. Um, but for AAT, I do carefully choose which clients um, would benefit from that. A lot of people will seek me out based on um, you know, my specialization in AAT is part of what I do. Um, not everyone would be motivated or would be a good candidate, you know, for AAT for several different reasons. Um, I choose, you know, registered therapy teams based on um, the dog, based on the client, their personality, their needs, their sizes. Um, we do lots of different things in therapy. We play games, we take turns, we work on a lot of social language, pragmatic language goals, initiating perspective taking, requesting, using verbal, nonverbal language. What does it mean for the dog versus a person? Things like that. Um, so it's, it's typically part of a therapy plan, a treatment plan um, to target goals as animal assisted therapy is really specific and tied to um, goals. It's driven. It's not just like animal assisted activities or animal assisted interventions, which are more generally general, you know, the read programs in the libraries or um, people who just kind of vis visit patients in a hospital casually like mine is really tied to their treatment plan to their specific goals and that's what makes AAT different from um, you know animal assisted activities. Next question Patricia likewise can you describe the process of using horses during equine therapy? So when a child is presented for equine assisted psychotherapy generally there's an intake done beforehand the therapist gets a fair amount of uh, information from the parent and or other doctors who may have seen the child. Uh, once that intake is done and the therapist has um, a decent amount of information, the next step is to introduce, introduce the child to a horse. Now at our facility, we have 18 horses. And generally, but not always, a child will have an affinity towards a particular horse. Uh, the horse specialist then brings that horse out to see if there is a true connection, maybe not from the horse to the client, the child, but certainly from the child to the horse. And then we begin to start the sessions. The sessions usually last about 40 to 45 minutes, depending upon the age of the child and how long the child can uh, sustain attention. Um, but then interactions begin. Um, we may walk the horse, the child may groom the horse, may be in a round pen with the horse to see what kind of levels of energy does this horse pick up and whether or not there is anything that, that is not being exposed that this horse can detect that the, the therapist can understand what's going on. Um, when there is real interaction working with the horse, you can pretty much see um, the guardrails start to come down with this child. Things that he may not feel comfortable saying to a parent, to a therapist, he may say it to the horse. Talking in an equine assisted psychotherapy session is never required unless the child or the client wants to do so. And at a particular point when that level of relaxation or defensiveness re uh, reduces, then that person begins to be able to talk about um, what they're feeling. And that's the beginning of the process. Well, Dr. Rogel, how does Beacon College incorporate animals in animal-assisted interventions? Yeah, so we take um, more of a, a animal-assisted educational approach. Um, so most of our, our planned kind of interventions focus on education-related um, goals or education um, initiatives that we're working on. Um, so this can include using animals not only as a teaching partner to help the, the students gain confidence in being around animals or interacting with animals, but also just confidence in social interactions, um, confidence in their ability um, to read out loud, to be in a safe and a comfortable environment. 
Um, within our space, we have a variety of live animals. Um, the primary ones that we like to use are our guinea pigs and also our rabbit that we have. Uh, the students will work with those animals, um, you know, not even just in a care and a, and a training standpoint, but they work with that animal just to develop social skills. And so they will spend time, you know, during class or outside of class, um, just being with the animal, talking to the animals, um, socializing, and really practicing these different skills that are needed um, for them to really gain that confidence in interacting with their peers. And it's a really cool change to see, and we see this growth and this development um, from the freshman year to the senior year of our students, and a lot of our students will actually contribute it to being around those animals and having that, that safe environment, that comfortable environment um, in which they feel welcomed and that they can just be themselves and, and really try to challenge themselves as an individual. That was very interesting, Dr. Ogle. Thank you. Yeah. So Ashley, why is animal-assisted therapy effective in speech and language therapy sessions? So there are many reasons um, why AAT is effective for speech language therapy. Um, a big one is they serve, um, they can serve as social catalysts for social interactions. Um, I have found, you know, through my research as well as, you know, during therapy that my clients often initiate interactions more with peers and adults when an animal is present. They just feel more comfortable. Um, they're more willing to engage with the therapist in a clinical situation as well if a dog is there. And I usually use, you know, work with therapy dogs. Um, they're also, dogs are also more easier to understand in terms of their verbal and nonverbal language um, versus people. Um, individuals with ASD can't always interpret or um, understand accurately the communication of other people. Um, they may, but they might not as, you know, to the same degree, um, where dogs just don't require that advanced social, you know, and communication skills to be understood or to interact with them successfully. Um, dogs have simple, you know, predictable behaviors that my clients more easily understand. So it's a good starting point for sure. Um, another reason is dogs are just judgment free, you know, the judgment free partners in therapy. So my clients often take more of a risk when there's an animal there. Um, they allow my clients to be more, you know, attentive, more engaged and more motivated in therapy. And thus they're more willing to communicate when they're, in, when they're more motivated by, you know, what they're doing. Um, I've seen more verbalizations. I've seen more on topic initiations when a live animal is present versus, you know, a standard therapy tool. Finally, a big reason um, is stress and anxiety. Oftentimes people with ASD have heightened um, stress and anxiety. So that's been shown to be reduced in the presence of an animal. Um, and so they just serve as social buffers in difficult so social situations. And Patricia, animal assisted intervention isn't like giving your child a Z pack for strep throat in that you know that once the pills are consumed, the problem is resolved. So how do parents know when the dosage, so to speak, for animal assisted intervention has been reached? So with like any therapy, therapy and healing begins when the client begins to understand the root of the problem. And there's no zap theory to, to therapy, whether it's talk therapy or otherwise. Does it go away? Hopefully not, because with every session, there may be a new revelation as to what things are, or just as important what they are not. So there is some understanding and, and grappling and resolving and understanding what the issue is to some level. Back to you, Dr. Ogle. So over the past 15 years, there's been a strong interest in studying the value of including animals in educational settings and their impact in supporting the cognition, social competence, and motor development of children. Uh, my question to you is, in general, what have the findings borne out? Yeah, so animal assisted intervention and the research that is currently available demonstrates that the interventions are effective to a point. One of the, the biggest concerns we have from a research standpoint is that the interventions are so tailored to the specific situation or the specific client or the, even the specific environment in which they're operating in that it's tough to translate those findings and generalize them to you know, another situation um, that could be using the same type of intervention. Because um, it really is dependent on the, the human aspect of things, both how it's being delivered by the handler and, or the therapist, um, but also the individuals receiving the therapy because they're all going to be 
be having different needs and, and at different points of um, their development. Um, there's a lot of promising things coming out of the research and we're hoping that they'll continue to grow and to blossom and to see more generalizable findings in the future. And there's a lot of work being done on that and even looking at um, just all of the research that has been made available over the past 15 years and kind of finding the commonalities and what are these threads that all these successful interventions have in common with one another um, to really define the practice and make it as valuable as possible when, when utilizing this type of therapy. Thank you, sir. So the bottom line is dogs and guinea pigs, they're cute, but is there really uh, a standard here for parents to consider using this type of intervention? Uh, can they expect some real uh, breaks th breakthroughs with this? Yeah, it depends on the, the individual, right? It depends on the individual receiving the therapy. Um, just like any other treatment that may exist for cognitive or social development um, and even educational initiatives, what may work for a group of people may not work for everybody or to the same extent as, that, as it was applied across the board. Um, in order for it to be really successful, you have to work with a, a therapist or a handler that truly knows the process and has been through this several times and knows what's going to work for that individual and really setting you know the foundation for here's what our goals are and here's how we're gonna accomplish that. Um, it's really up to everybody as a team to communicate and to work together to figure out if this is the best in, uh, intervention or what intervention may actually work better. Um, and then how do you continue to refine it as you keep delivering that intervention because um, you want the strength and the quality of, of the, the outcomes that you're seeing from uh, the intervention to continue not just for in the short term but in the long term as well. Well, thank you for that and thank you Dr. Ogle, Ashley Colasea, and Patricia E. Kelly for joining me today and sharing your expertise on this subject of animal assisted intervention. Do you have questions about learning differences? Are there concerns you are facing daily in your journey with learning and attention issues? We are happy to answer your questions on air. Sign up via our website, awodtv.org, to have your questions answered during our Ask the Experts segment on an upcoming episode of A World of Difference. Now, let's meet this month's difference maker, who certainly knows a thing or two about the human-animal bond. Though not diagnosed with autism until adulthood, as a child, Dr. Temple Grandin quickly learned that she processed things differently than her neurotypical classmates, only developing speech skills when she was nearly four years old. Drawn to STEM-related activities like electronics and rocketry, she was encouraged to pursue a career as a scientist by her peers and a former teacher and mentor. And the rest is history. Grandin has since authored over 60 peer-reviewed scientific papers on animal behavior. Half the cattle in the United States today are handled in facilities she designed. And while much of her life's work has been to understand her own autistic mind, her goal remains to better the treatment of neurodiverse individuals like her. Here's a World of Difference correspondent Brad Kuhn with her amazing story. My name is Temple Grandin. I'm not like other people. Most people don't have Claire Danes play them in a movie about their life. Most people haven't been recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Dr. Temple Grandin is not like other people, but she cares deeply about them, especially those who, like her, see the world through the eyes of autism. I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. I've been there now It'll be 31 years in March, and I uh, study animal behavior. I've designed cattle handling facilities. Uh, for me, one of the things that's really made a life worthwhile is having a really interesting career. I put a lot of emphasis on career. If someone says, my kid went to college because of your book, or my kid has a job because of one of your lectures, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. Or I designed something for your, your rancher friend and it's working really well with their cattle. I get satisfaction out of the things I invent and the things I suggest. Right now, I get a lot of joy out of problem solving, like just figuring out how to uh, how to solve problems. Because I'm finding 
that with visual thinking, uh, how did I learn how a whole big complicated processing plant worked? When I first walked in, I go, this is so complicated. How's the plant manager understand it? But then after watching it every Tuesday afternoon for six months, I videotaped the entire plant into my mind and then I just walked through it. But that's not done in 30 seconds. Grandin didn't speak until she was almost four years old, prompting a doctor to diagnose brain damage and recommend that she be institutionalized. Well, I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. I knew what I wanted to say, but I couldn't say it. I just couldn't get the words out. When the grown-ups talked really fast, it went into gibberish. I actually thought grown-ups had their own special language. When people slowed down, I could understand them. So my speech teacher would hold up a cup like this and she'd say, now say cup. And then she'd go cup, buh. And she'd go back and forth between saying it really slow and saying it just the regular way, fast. And then gradually my speech came in. I was fully verbal by four and I'm partially verbal probably at three. Elementary school went pretty well. I was in a small elementary school, old fashioned fifties classes. Manners were taught in a really structured way in the 50s. I think that's another reason why there's grandfathers that, have, that are on the autism spectrum that had successful jobs because shaking hands, saying please and thank you, that was taught in such a structured way in the 50s, which was you know extremely helpful. So elementary school went pretty good. High school was a disaster, complete disaster in a large school. I was bullied, I was teased. When I was in ninth grade, I reacted by throwing a book at a girl who called me a retard. And I ended up going to a special boarding school for kids with problems. And I would guess most of them had autism. But you got to remember, this is early 60s. And they were still in some of the psychoanalysis sort of stuff. And uh, so it was emotional disturbance, you know, back then. But when I look back at some of the other students in that school, there was, a, I'd say half of them probably were on the autism spectrum. Uh, and I was not a good student there at all. And Mr. Patey, the headmaster, kind of said, let her get through her adolescence. He put me to work running the horse barn. And I did that for about three years. And in doing that, I learned how to work. There were nine stalls to clean every single day. Horses to be fed, horses to be put in and out of the barn. And I was proud of the fact that I was, um, you know, uh, considered responsible enough to do this job. But I look back on this, I learned really important work skills. I'm seeing a lot of students today that may be on the autism spectrum doing really well in school, but they can't handle it in the workplace. And that's because they didn't learn work skills. I'm seeing too many kids today where they're so overprotected, they don't shop by themselves. I was shopping by the time I was seven. <laughs> and I knew exactly what I could buy with 50 cents. I could see things that were doors to opportunity. And a lot of people aren't very good at that. Uh, when I was, it went to a, a, a cattle event and the editor of the magazine was there. I said, I got to get his card because I'd like to uh, have my master's thesis research. I can write that up in that magazine. But a lot of people don't see that door. And then I, that got me a press pass into a big fancy national meeting, the very expensive uh, entrance fee for free. And then I got the editor's card for the national magazine. See those sort, and that was step by step. It wasn't something that happened overnight. And then I started writing in the national magazine about some of the things I did in cattle handling. And then that would get other jobs. It's something that it was filled up slowly. But I saw opportunity. And I find that um, I'm seeing a lot of parents, they don't see doorways to opportunity. Like you have, might have both parents are computer programmers. I've run into two or three of these cases. And the kids are whiz at math. And mom and dad don't think to teach them programming. And then I bring that up and they go, oh, that's a good idea. We'll do that. You see, they'd gotten so much into the autism uh, bucket, they couldn't think of anything else. No, you need to be teaching your kid programming. Now I tried programming that didn't work for me, but you don't know until you try it. At 73, Grandin is still teaching and still helping others with autism overcome hurdles and live their best lives. 
For these and so many other reasons, A World of Difference is proud to name Temple Grandin as our Difference Maker of the Month. For A World of Difference, I'm Brad Kuhn. Thanks for the story, Brad, and congratulations, Temple. Your contributions to STEM have stimulated new journeys for neurodiverse individuals who are walking similar paths. That brings us to the end of this episode of A World of Difference. How are we doing? Do you like what you're seeing? Are there learning disability issues you'd like us to cover? Are there some features you'd like us to present? Let us hear from you. Your feedback lets us know whether we are on the right path or whether we need to alter course to bring you the information that truly helps celebrate and support you on your neurodiversity journey. You can write us at contact at awodtv.org. Meanwhile, you can rewatch this episode or catch up on past episodes at awodtv.org. There you will find bios of our experts plus downloadable expanded tip sheets. You can also visit the Beacon College Facebook page, clicking on videos and then browsing under series or view the program on Beacon College's YouTube channel. Podcast lovers can listen on the go on Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, and other popular podcasting platforms. On our next episode, we'll look at effective strategies for supporting students with attention issues. Until then, for David DeJohn, Brad Kuhn, and the Lakefront TV crew, I'm Daryl Owens. Thanks for watching.